something else really interesting has occurred uh, that we have discovered. And I want to share this with you because the, uh, the archaeology... This will kind of be an indication on how archaeology works. Archaeology never has the last word. For instance, let me show you this. I'm going to show you this physical implement. Archaeologically, they have found a bronze arrow. Hard to see. There's the picture of it. This long picture, this bronze arrow. This thing is three feet long. Now, they found this arrow, and they suppose that there was a lot, or arrow, I meant this bronze sword. I meant sword, I said arrow. They found this, and there's supposed to be large armies. But the archaeologists haven't found thousands of these, but they have found this one. So we know that the ancients made these things. That's not the question. The question is, where are they? That's what I explained in some of my tapes. This is, by the way, this is in the uh, Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, Volume 8, Number 1, 1999. I've already referenced to this one before. But that's on page 75, that uh, bronze arrow, and then the discussion of the bron or bronze sword, and the discussion... That. My point is, ten years ago they didn't have that, but archaeology discovered it. Archaeology has discovered something else very remarkable, as William Hamblin notes in Pressing Forward with the Book of Mormon, edited by John Welch and Melvin J. Thorne. This is on page 2. 60, 259 and 260. He says, when we compare the history of ironworking in the Norse colonies of Greenland and Vinland, that is in the northeastern North America, the Norse colonies, the Vikings, in Greenland lasted for five centuries, from AD 986 to 1480, almost to the time when Columbus sailed. During this time, they made occasional exploring expeditions to modern Canada and the northeastern United States, and they established colonies, and these colonies lasted at least several decades in Labrador, and quite probably elsewhere in North America. So we know the Vikings got here. We know they brought with them metallurgical skills. Now here's the interesting point. They were familiar with all forms of medieval European metallurgy. They brought iron smelting technology to North America by AD 1000, as indicated by the discovery of a smithy and an iron slag at the Viking site of Leonce O Meadows in Labrador. Yet despite knowing contacts between the Vikings, the Eskimos, the Inuits, and the Algonquin Indians, iron smelting technology was never transmitted from the Vikings to the Native Americans. It was not transmitted. In other words, the Viking experience in Greenland and in the northeast coastal area of North America provides an example of the introduction of iron smelting metallurgy and technology into a new region, but the failure of Native Americans to adopt this new technology. That's interesting, isn't it? This example is quite instructive for students of the Book of Mormon. Nephi was familiar with the ancient Near Eastern metallurgical technologies, which he brought from the Near East to the New World. Metallurgy was known and utilized to a limited extent by the Nephites during certain periods. But it is also quite possible that the full range of metallurgical knowledge may have been lost at some point in time. When the Nephites migrated to new areas where ores were unavailable, and they couldn't work them, they lost the metallurgical knowledge, of course. It could have been lost within a single generation, is what he says on page uh, 260. 
Similar pressures may have been exerted on Norse colonizers in the New World. Iron working apparently occurred under difficult circumstances in Greenland and Vinland. Archaeologists have discovered an axe made from a whalebone which was used in place of rare or costly iron axes. At any rate, precisely paralleling the experiences of the Vikings in the New World, metal smelting technology did not spread beyond Nephite society to other peoples and regions of the New World. It apparently disappeared with the destruction of the Nephite civilization, if not before, just as iron smelting disappeared in Greenland and northeastern North America with the collapse of the Viking colonies in the late 15th century. Now here we have a real historical situation in our land, North America, that shows just because one group had the metallurgy and the smelting doesn't mean automatically that it will spread and be picked up by all the other populations. It wasn't. How do we know that wasn't the case with the ancient Nephites also? It very well could have been. Things disappear, and as I showed in my former tape with John Sorensen's metallurgy studies, there are archaeologists who are complaining to other archaeologists that they are not looking for metallurgy smelting sites. That's why they haven't found any. And what the archaeologists are wanting to do is dig up the grand cities, of course, because that's where the glory for the archaeologist is. That's where all the money is. That's where the great nobles are buried, and so on and so forth. The metalworking and smelting technologies and places where they did that, that's not going to be in the middle of the city. That's going to be outside of the city. But no one's looking for them, so they aren't finding them. That is a fascinating situation. Archaeology is a very incomplete science. I have a very good example of that right here. <clears throat> there is a Herschel Shanks and Joseph A. Colloway, The Height of Ancient Israelites, a letter in the Biblical Archaeology Review for 1984. They are talking about what were swords of Nephi's time like? Jerusalem, 600 B.C. He says this in the, this is the uh, Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, Volume 2, Number 2, Fall 1993, uh, pages 194 and 195. Adams is saying, what were the swords like? Archaeology has unfortunately found few swords. Why? Well, mainly because swords are made of iron, which can quickly rust away. But... One exciting find was excavated by Avraham Eiton at a site three miles south of Jericho called Verid Jericho. The sword found at Verid Jericho is three feet long, about three inches wide, is made of iron, and has a bronze haft with a wooden grip. Even the tip of the sword remains intact. The strata from which the sword was excavated dates to the late 7th century, or about 620 B.C. Most swords from the Middle East, as portrayed in pictures and reliefs, were short, and they seem to have been used like daggers. Thus, this three-foot sword from Vera Jericho seems to be unique in its large size. Something else makes the Vera Jericho sword unique. And that is the fact that Israelite men of this time seem to have been only about five feet tall. This sword was almost as big as they were. Thus, a sword three feet long and three inches wide would be a quite large weapon for them to wield. And it brings the image of the medieval broadsword to mind. Perhaps the Israelite warriors used this sword in a similar manner. So, the fact that a sword is discovered that dates to 620 B.C. in Jericho, but there's only one, you know. We know if we accept the biblical story, folks, that there were umpteen tens of thousands of warriors fighting at Jericho. We know that. Well, where are all the swords? The archaeologist does not say that because we lack the archaeological remains that the written record is false. That is not how they do it. Now, that's how an anti-Mormon would do it, but that is not the way of archaeology. They're simply saying, we haven't found it yet. 